Meet Davis. Hi. Davis is from Pollock, South Dakota. Yep. We took Davis from Pollock to fish for Pollock in Alaska. Sure did. The same wild-caught Pollock in a McDonald's filet of fish sandwich. Uh-huh. There were boats, nets, waves. And fish. And some delicious filet of fish sandwiches. So you could say Davis is one Paul lucky guy. Good one. Thanks, Davis. Catch some Pollock of your own with McDonald's filet of fish Fridays. Just $1.99 for a limited time. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or any combo meal. Blog Talk Radio. Happy New Year, folks. It's, of course, me. It's Danny Tisdale. And I hope you are doing well in this new year with the new show. And, uh, you know, I, I know it's the 14th, and it's a little while since we've uh, talked to each other, directly or indirectly, but it's glad and it's great to be back, even though I – feels like about 20 degrees. Well, you know what? It feels like about 10 degrees to me, but uh, it's, what, 29 degrees out there. Of course, we want to keep track of the weather. And, you know, I really hope that you had a great New Year, you had a great holiday, and that you were, of course, uh, uh, you know, got the things you wanted from Santa Claus and your wife or your husband, whoever it may be. Uh, I certainly did, and uh, I am more than anything, knock on wood, glad to be here with you uh, for this year and uh, and another time together. And as usual, uh, we'll kick off a little bit of where we left off. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook at HWMAC, also Twitter at HWMAC, and really all across the social media uh, at Harlem World Magazine. Just put that in your search engines and check us out. And, yeah, you know, I, I want to get right to it because uh, I've been trying to talk to this gentleman uh, for a little while. Uh, and I think it started the end of last year, but we uh, did an original story on him, and then I wanted to follow up and have a conversation with uh, Thomas Moorhead, Thomas Moorhead. Uh, Mr. Moorhead is the first African-American McLaren Lamborghini car dealer. He's the father, uh, a husband. Uh, last year we posted a story about his success story, and now we actually have the man here to speak to him. Hello, Mr. Moorhead. How are you doing? And Happy New Year. Well, Happy New Year to you and to your listeners as well. And it's a real pleasure to have an opportunity to be on your show. What a great way to start the new year. I don't know if it gets better than this, that we get to speak to someone who has done some really great work, uh, both in the business world uh, and in the world in general. Uh, So I want to get right to it. Uh, As I mentioned in the intro, the first African-American McLaren and Lamborghini car dealer, how did you get your your start, Mr. Moorhead, in this uh, incredible run of success that you're having? Well, actually, it started with a fraternity brother of mine who, about 33 years ago, uh, Hmm. talked to me about perhaps looking at the car business. And when he suggested it to me, I said no right off the bat. I just said, it's not for me. (laughs) You know, I was in the process of working at the University of Michigan and going to school part-time and trying to get a Ph.D., and I knew I had two courses Mm. and a dissertation to do in order to finish up. And, you know, growing up in a small town in Louisiana, uh, Mm. education was everything to those uh, who was around me. And I I just knew that I just had to fulfill that that dream. But Mr. Bradley said to me that uh, I've been watching you and I just think that you would really be good. And I said, Mr. Bradley, I... You know, a car dealer represents to me somebody who talks fast. Uh, You'll see them in a big plaid jacket and stretching his pants and smoking cigarettes. And I just don't think that that's me. And uh, he said, well, I understand. He said, but I'd like to have you go over to Detroit and take a look at a couple of dealerships. Hmm. And uh, let's talk about it. And so I did. I went over and I looked at a couple, and I went back, and he said, well, what did you see? And I said, well, I, I saw much different, um, I can have a much different perspective now. I said, I thought I was walking into kind of a Wall Street environment, 
young men were walking around with bow ties and dressed very well and uh, selling great products. I said, um, but I'm still not sure. So we spent about four or five different sessions. And the last one, of course, he said, let me just kind of walk you through uh, the last 10 years of um, my dealership. And hmm. in looking at that, I could obviously see a rather cyclical nature of the business because in the car business you have probably about five, six, and if you're lucky, maybe seven good years, and then it will drop off and you'll go into a little bit of a recession, and then it will come back. But end of the day, I could obviously see that it was a good business and you could truly Hmm. make a living if you applied yourself. And that's what uh, he said to me. He said, now, the biggest problem for you is that you've been teaching at Michigan, you've been directing a program there, and you're trying to Mm. get that Ph.D. He said, but you're going to have to take a step back in order to take a step forward. Forward. And all of your colleagues at Michigan are going to want to know what's wrong with Tom. And uh, he was absolutely (laughs) right. Uh, That was the biggest problem for me. And, uh, but I, I said to him, I said, Mr. B, I can handle that. And um, true enough, I spent the time with him and worked with him learning the business uh, right. to make sure that's what I wanted to do. Well, it, it, that's a, an incredible story. And on the outside looking in, in some ways it sounds a little straightforward, but uh, I, I can imagine that it probably isn't. Um but earlier we were talking about your uh, uh, coming out of Louisiana and um, bringing your professional skills to the car business. But what made – do you see any difference between the the young men and women you grew up with and yourself? I mean, what, what – was there a, a difference there? Was there a certain kind of drive that you had that – I, I'm not trying to say that they're that different, but there is, a, I, I guess, some kind of difference, uh, uh, opportunity that you took advantage of. Was it, were there some things that you, uh, I guess, as you look back and uh, see your journey and their journey that there was a difference? Oh, absolutely. Um, coming out of Monroe, Louisiana, you know, and – in a much more what I consider to be a uh, very supportive environment. You know, when you mm. when you attended school, um, it wasn't just your parents, but it was all of the people in your neighborhood, neighborhood. all of the teachers. Yes. And that neighborhood environment was one that was so important when we were growing right. up because right. if you did something wrong, two blocks away, by the time you got home, your parents <laughs> knew about it. You probably got a spanking when uh, when you did it two blocks away. Before you and got when home. you got home, you got another one. So, <laughs> I, I hate to say that, but that's really what happened when we grew up. Um, everybody in the community helped to raise us and take us to the next level. Uh, uh, it makes complete sense because, uh, again, a little earlier for, for the listeners, uh, I didn't know that you were from Louisiana and my mother's from Louisiana, and your example that you just gave is, uh, uh, a matter of fact, that I hadn't told you is that I'm an educator when I'm not wearing the Harlem World hat and uh, uh, letting them know that, letting my students know that they reflect the community uh, is something that I always use. <laughs> so uh, the world well, is, is not that large after all. Yes, you're absolutely right. And certainly in your case, being able to empathize with me, uh, the way uh, I was brought up and certainly the way you were brought up uh, is very important. So really appreciate that. So when did you know, uh, Mr. Moorhead, that you were on the right track? Was there a cloudy day and, the clouds moved apart and the sun shined on you and you heard a noise like that and you said, oh, I'm on the right track. Or Was there anything like that that kind of let you know that, okay, this is, this is good? Well, you, that's an interesting question because 
I had one of those moments um, hmm. when I started out, just before we got started, I said to Mr. Bradley, I said, um, Mr. Bradley, what uh, what department uh, will I manage? And he said, um, well, first of all, you can't manage, manage what you don't know. He hmm. said, uh, I'm going to start you off right. in sales, and uh, I'd like for you to do that for a year. And I said, oh, okay. I said, well, now tell me something. Who's the best salesman that you have? And he said, well, why are you asking? And I said, what's his record? And he said, well, that young man out on the lot out there is the number one salesman here, and he's probably selling between 30 and 35 cars a month. And I said, okay. I said, well, then I'm going to have to be the number one salesman. I'm going to have to beat him. And and he said, oh, sure. You just learned how to sell a car. And I said, all right. So the day that I had an opportunity to finish a month and beat him and become the number one salesman for that month, was really when I think I really realized that sales was for me and the car business Hmm. in particular was for me. Hmm. And uh, from that point on, I didn't want to look back. I always said, you know, I don't want to look through the rearview mirror. I want to look look out of the uh, the front windshield because that's much bigger and the opportunities are greater. So that's why. No, I, it's, uh, it's, it's you, know, you know, as we were talking earlier, I, I'm very interested in, you know, you know, this process of how someone gets to where they are and um, why sales and why cars? Well, I looked at Mr. Bradley's success and in that community, which – Ann Arbor, Michigan is a very learned community, and it's one where one of the greatest institutions in the world is, is, is there. And I just felt like if, if one could make it in that community, because on a whole, most of the individuals who walk through the door looking for an automobile, many of them are coming from the various, the big three, as we call them at that time, Ford, Chrysler, and GM. Right. So they really knew more about the product because they, for the most part, worked in the industry. So it was a learning curve for us, and certainly me in particular, also was a challenge in order to stay on top. And that was the thing that I think drove me more than anything else. It was just that that real quest to to want to be the best and wanting to be just like Mr. Bradley. So... Mm -hmm. And I wanted to impress him because he had really taken taken a chance on me. Chance on you. Right? And yes, and with that, I wanted to make sure that I did everything I could to be successful and to also make him successful. So that was it. So I would start in the morning. I would always be the first salesperson to get there, and I would be the last one to <laughs> Classic. leave. Classic. Yes, it was it was classic for me. So I, I enjoyed it, and I got up every day and went to work with a smile on my face. And it was sometimes when a, when you walked through that door, you knew it was lights, camera, action, and whatever was going on otherwise, you had to put it behind you and meet the, the customers with a smile and be the best that you could be that Certainly. particular day. Certainly. Certainly. Well, I I, I, I want to instigate a little bit, and I hope uh, it doesn't uh, ruin our conversation here, because I know that Louisiana people love to win, and I know that uh, Louisiana people have trouble with Alabama, because I'm a big Alabama fan. <laughs> I had to go there. I had to. I had to. I had to. Okay. Well, hey, now, I'm happy to hear that. Uh, and and <laughs> The excellence that you all have uh, been able to maintain uh, has uh, served you well. But we uh-oh, have a young uh-oh. fellow at the University of Michigan that uh, is going to, in the next couple of years, be a uh, real challenge for the Alabama Crimson, Crimson Tide. 
So that's just, this is going to be fun. <laughs> you just took the I, number I had one. to. I had to. <laughs> yeah, you took the number one running back in the nation. It was between us and Alabama, and he decided to go to Alabama. So uh, that's okay, though. We'll uh, we'll get the next one. Well, but, I, uh, after <laughs> Clemson, I, I have to knock on a whole lot of wood. So uh, you know, I, I know nothing lasts forever. You know. Well, so I, I also wanted to shift a little bit and ask you, uh, you know, let me take a quick station ID and let our listeners know they're listening to Harlem World Radio and to check us out on Facebook and Twitter at um, HWMAG for the best in Harlem all the time, every week, and especially for the, the new year. And, and I just wanted to get back to the question I was going to ask you because I know that you're – you know, I'm going to ask you another question because I'm always, uh, okay. uh, you know, with the new year, we're hiring new salespeople and, you know, bringing on a harder grow as much as possible. And I'm always going back and forth with the word sales because it seems to, at least for me, for some reason, have a, a, a bad, it, it wants to leave a bad taste in my mouth. And maybe that's because like you mentioned, you know, I think about sales and I think of, you know, the used car salesman. Why does sales have that reputation? And and what what is your uh, key to, you know, success for somebody who wants to follow in your footsteps? I know I'm asking you two questions at once. No, no, I understand. Well, I think it goes back to one of your earlier questions, you know, when you were talking about, um, you know, where I grew up and yeah. why, you know, Louisiana and that kind of thing. One of the things that uh, I always look at is the way we were brought up in Louisiana, and particularly in Monroe, uh, is my grandfather, who uh, was really uh, very instrumental in raising me, of course, uh, used to say, young man, if you shake hands with somebody and you give them your word, make sure you honor the word that you have given them. Hmm. And for the most part, uh, when you look at salespeople, you know, good salespeople. Now, I'm always talking to my people about being good is one thing, but being great is something else. Hmm. As a difference for us and for me in particular, and that is that I want to be a great, business person, a great salesperson. Now, if you just want to be in the game and you, you know, um, Jack Welch talks about in his book, Winning, about working with your people and 20% of those who, who work with for you are your superstars and 70% of those who will maintain and just get the job done for you right. if you give them the ball, Okay. But 10% of those individuals are just sitting on the bench, just happy to put on the uniform every day. It is that <laughs> 10% that I'm constantly telling my managers that we need to work on trying to remove from the organization and bring in a little bit better talent. Mm-hmm. So as we bring in better talent, we want to bring in talent with people who will exercise those muscles in the face, smile, mm-hmm go beyond to be the very best that they can be for the boss, which is not Tom Moorhead, but it's Mr. and Mrs. Customer who walks through our doors. That's what we're looking for. And that's the kind of salesperson that we want, because those are the kind that's going to help make you a success, along with some other factors as well. So, Mr. Moorhead, is it that you put your hat on to be that salesperson when you come through the door that morning, or do you try to wear that hat all the time? I wear it every day, all day. Um, I'm always looking for that edge. With me, it's it's like, how do we, one, move to the next level? I, I remember when I started out, And um, I tried to get Rolls Royce, and they told me I couldn't do it. And I think that bothered me to a degree that um, (laughs) I never forgot it. And I I just said that uh, one day 
uh, I'm going to make that happen. And the right. day that we uh, were fortunate enough to make that happen, uh, that really kind of gave us the foundation. And I think the job that we did with Rolls Royce also it helped to propel us to get mm. Lamborghini and McLaren. Mm. So okay. that's what, what 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 it really was. So uh, um, is that how McLaren Lamborghini kind of comes into the picture? Because I'm wondering, well, yeah. why Lamborghini and McLaren? Well, you know, it's really the same buyer, okay. and what, what we looked at, we are located in Loudoun County, Virginia, which is the richest county in America, and the second richest county is Fairfax. Hmm. So being in a market like that and having BMW, I knew that in yeah. order to right. move to the next level, Mm-hmm. Uh, I had to look at things that would start to bring more people into our environment. And one led to the other. Really, manufacturers are looking for individuals who can not only sell their product, but can take care of the customers who walk through the door in an, in an exceptional manner. Okay, so you have to be able to provide all of the other key ingredients that it takes. So... Um, creating a culture in your facility uh, that is conducive for those individuals is the key to our success, has been the key to our, to our success. I, I, I'm i not surprised and uh, had a feeling you might say that, and we are, believe it or not, down to our last uh, 10 minutes here, uh, and I'm completely off script a little bit here and about oh, to do it again. Okay. Um, well, uh, right. because you just uh, bring up so many great points, and, and one of those, again, that we kind of talked about off air before uh, getting on air is I haven't heard you talk about uh, being a, a black man or some of the white people that you work with. How does race for you play into this, or does it? I. It doesn't for me because as I look at it, I never really think about it in that sense. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's about excelling at what you do. And, you know, we live in such an international community. And one of the keys for us has been when I first built my dealership in um, Virginia there, uh, all my signage was done in four languages. Um, and I did that mm. primarily because the individuals who walked through the door, I needed to make sure that we had somebody there who spoke the, their language. The language, right. And when I look at the fact that it's all about trying to make sure you meet your customers' needs. And if right. you are in a position that you can meet their needs, where they feel comfortable. That is, you want to have a conducive environment for them to come do business with you, be it sales or service, and feel really good about being there. I tell my staff, it is important that we are number one, okay? But I really want to have customers say, it is just a great place to do business. When I walk in there, I feel really good. Mm. I'm comfortable. And we have had people who've walked in, but we've had to go get somebody to be able to speak the language. So when we look at our customer base, it is not about color. It's about making sure that we provide the best service. And that means that we have somebody who can make them feel comfortable in that buying experience. And that customer service has no color, obviously. Uh, at least it, it certainly does, does not. Right. People right. want to be served, but they want to be served in a, in a uh, way that makes them feel good about spending their money. And that's what we have to always remember, because without them, we might as well lock our doors. And I don't plan and to do we, that. So, uh, No, I, I wasn't even going to ask you that, so <laughs> I, I know that uh, – I don't think that's in your DNA that that's uh, uh, even an option. Um, You're right. Uh, how do you, you just... 
Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, because I'm always looking for staff, that it's really in that DNA to come, smile, right. and want to be one of the best. Right. Right. Those people are hard to find, from what I hear. Yes, they are. That is really one of the key ingredients to to success, and that is, you know, you can have all the great policies and procedures, but it really takes good people, people. to really do you drive that that point of loss and service to clients who are coming in. And and those clients and those customers remember those people too and, and look for them and want to come back and talk to them and Absolutely. work with them and, and get a heads up. And it's more than just business. It's, you know, might feel like family. So I, I, I hear you and I completely understand. But I, I how do you unwind? Do you, are you a golfer? You read a book not- or are you – well, I tell you, for me, growing up. Or do in, you unwind? In yes, I do. Uh, growing <laughs> okay. up in Louisiana, I was around water a lot. And uh, ah. playing golf and, and being on the water for me is, is the times that I can truly unwind a little bit. Uh, I find myself, if I'm just sitting, whether I'm fishing or whether I'm uh, just sitting on the water, reading a book, it allows me to really just kind of sit back and relax and kind of think about. And I'm, as my wife says, I'm always thinking about what can I do to be <laughs> measurably better <laughs> the next day we go to work. So, no, I, I'm only continue. laughing because that sounds like my girlfriend. So, you know, oh, it's, okay. it's, a, it's a constant. And, and um, I was also laughing because the last time, I swung. I was on the golf court and I uh, was swinging at the ball. I, the uh, person I was golfing with told me I was swinging the club like I was swinging a bat. So uh, okay. I, 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 I think I need some work. Um, so, uh, Mr. Moreland, we are down to our last three minutes, and I'm going to ask you two questions that uh, hopefully. Uh, you can answer in two minutes. One okay. is, what ad- advice do you have for someone who wants to follow in in your footsteps of success? Uh, and um, and do you have a, a a favorite place in Harlem? Those are my two last questions. Advice oh, for somebody okay. who wants to follow in your footsteps and your favorite place in Harlem. Uh, make sure that the job that you're going to do is one that you truly love. It really makes you get up and want to go to work with a smile each and every day. And um, one of my favorite places in New York is a place over on Lenox Avenue uh, called the Red Rooster. I truly like oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> the young man and does an outstanding job. The service is Marcus. good. And right. He has opened a uh, spot at the MGM in National Harbor, That's Maryland. Right. Uh, kind of brought one a little closer to us. That's right. That, that That's fantastic food. And you just made my mouth water mentioning the Red Rooster. And if uh, our uh, readers and listeners want to stay in touch, Mr. Moreland, how can they do that? Do you have a website or? Yes, actually, um, you know, I, I'll give you my email because I, uh, I try and get back to all of those who uh, – Okay. You know, send me a note, and that's, uh, that's Thomas dot Moorhead at bmwsterling dot com. Again, Thomas dot Moorhead at bmwsterling dot com. Fantastic. Um, and uh, what's what's next for you in uh, two thousand? 17 does this are you tweaking anything is there anything different than what you've done before that you're kicking in the gear for 217 or well uh, we didn't come in number one uh and i just Uh, said to the team that guys it was not acceptable for us not to be number one so the tweak for this year is to do everything that we can to to rise to the top of the be number one. So that's really it for us for this year. 
Well, thank you, sir. I uh, truly uh, enjoyed this conversation and have learned a lot. And uh, at the same time, some things were confirmed. I, I really thank you for uh, being on the show, and uh, I hope we can do another one sometime uh, down the road. Thank you. Well, I look forward to it, and thank you, and thank you, listeners. Much success, and I know you're going to get to number one. All right. Take care, sir. <laughs> well, we're going to try right. very hard. Thank you again. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, folks, that was the Danny Tisdale Show, and that was Mr. Thomas Moorhead uh, talking about the uh, great work that he does, and we look forward to doing another show and uh, have you listen in. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Meet Davis. Hi. Davis is from Pollock, South Dakota. Yep. We took Davis from Pollock to fish for Pollock in Alaska. Sure did. The same wild-caught Pollock in a McDonald's filet of fish sandwich. Uh Uh-huh. There were boats, nets, waves. And fish. And some delicious filet of fish sandwiches. So you could say Davis is one Paul lucky guy. Good one. Thanks, Davis. Catch some Pollock of your own with McDonald's filet of fish Fridays. Just $1.99 for a limited time. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or any combo meal. Meet Davis. Hi. Davis is from Pollock, South Dakota. Yep. We took Davis from Pollock to fish for Pollock in Alaska. Sure did. The same wild-caught Pollock in a McDonald's filet of fish sandwich. Uh Uh-huh. There were boats, nets, waves. And fish. And some delicious filet of fish sandwiches. So you could say Davis is one Paul lucky guy. Good one. Thanks, Davis. Catch some Pollock of your own with McDonald's filet of fish Fridays. Just $1.99 for a limited time. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or any combo meal.